I was reading this in my devotions recently, and I thought I'd share it with you as we begin. Paul Tripp says this, We are just too easily satisfied as believers. It's not that we want too much from God. No, the reality is that often we are willing to settle for too little. We're content with a little bit of change, a little bit of growth, or a little bit of maturity. We settle. We say that we're thankful for God's grace, but we become spiritually satisfied, he says, long before that grace has completed its full work in our lives. If our parenting uh, is working well enough, if our marriages are livable, if our jobs aren't terrible, if our finances aren't a disaster, if we have a decent prayer life and a decent quiet time, most of us as Christians are satisfied, but God is not satisfied. He knows that we will need his transforming grace until sin is no more. We will continue, he says, to need his intervention until we've been completely formed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, the way that most of us would like to be formed into the image of Christ is probably not the way that God goes about it. See, most of us would like to be formed and matured uh, in our relationship with Christ, become more like Jesus by God in our sleep, like taking his magic Holy Spirit wand and waving it above our heads or above our hearts while we comfortably sleep in our air-conditioned home. No pain, no, 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 no discomfort in any way. Just wave your magic wand across us and make me magically, divinely more mature and make me stronger. But, but the truth is, often, and you found this to be true, the way that God matures us and grows us as his children is actually not through comfort, it's through suffering, isn't it? It's through suffering. As much as we don't want it, we, we need it. Because otherwise, as Paul Tripp just said, we would settle for far too little of who God is. And there are things, and you know this to be true as well as I do, there are things about our God, there are things about his character, there are things about his presence that can only be experienced in the darkness, things that would not be fully realized in the light. See, when things are great and there's money in the bank and the sun is shining and everyone's smiling and everything is rainbows and unicorns and butterflies, there, there are aspects about our God we can appreciate. There are things we can thank him for and be grateful for and bless his name for, for sure. But there are depths and there are riches of who he is that are not experienced without us going through the painful seasons of suffering. Would you agree with that this morning? And so what we're going to talk about today as we, as we weave through this is how that we find ourselves as human beings in very painful positions and situations that we would not have chosen. We as believers are forced to deal with difficult circumstances that we would rather not. We are consistently faced with the unplanned, the unexpected, and the unwanted in life. But in this process called suffering, God does an incredible work in us and, and he also, I want you to see this today, he also can do an incredible work through you in spite of and in light of your sufferings. Let me explain what I mean. Go to our passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're just going to look at two verses today, verse 3 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Everyone say comfort. The big idea today who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, this passage, this section of chapter 1 in Paul's letter to the Corinthians is all about pain and suffering and God's role of comforter in the midst of that pain and suffering. And what, what I want you to see first is if you're taking notes, number one, what I want you to see first is the person of comfort. The person of comfort. Paul says that God is the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God as father of mercies, that means his person is the very source of mercy. Without him as father of mercies, there is no mercy. So he's not over here just scrounging, trying to collect a little mercy. 
so that he can pass that along. No, he's the very source of mercy, okay? We won't make this health class or anatomy class like you had to endure in high school and talk about the birds and the bees too closely, but you understand, when it comes to a mother and a father and a child, a new life that will be born, even though the mom does the hard work of carrying the baby for nine months, amen, ladies? You can say amen there. It's okay. This is a safe place, all right? Without the Father, without that source of life, there is no new life to come, okay? We'll leave that there, okay? And, and, and he says that God is the Father of mercies. He's the very source of mercies, which means he's never going to run out. It, it actually echoes much of what uh, Jeremiah the prophet said in the Old Testament in, in a book called Lamentations. Uh, in, in chapter 3, verse 22, this is what Jeremiah the prophet writes. He says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His, what's the next word? What's the next word? Mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He says, God's mercies are new every morning. You know what that means? That means God is not in the business of giving out stale mercy. God is not in the business of giving out worn out mercies. No, they are fresh they are usable. Have you guys ever been given something before uh, that was not usable? It seemed like it was a nice gesture. Like, you remember hand-me-downs when you were a kid? Anybody, any hand-me-down people in the room? Our family, you know, you get that trash bag full of all that random stuff, and you go rifling through it, hoping there'll be something good, right? Now, we did have one set of cousins who was pretty wealthy, and they would actually give us like Nike and Jordan and Adidas stuff in there with the tag still on it, right? You talk about favor, right? That's favor, all right? But oftentimes, when you would dig into a trash bag full of hand-me-downs, you know what you'd find. you find, like, worn-out T-shirts with stains on them or tears in them. It's like the stuff we give to the missionaries. We shouldn't, but it's the stuff you donate to the missions closet, right? You find a pair of shoes that maybe it looks decent on top, but you look at the bottom and the tread's worn off, right? That, that, that may seem like a useful gift, but it's not actually very useful in the end. Listen to me. God's mercies are not that way. God's mercies are useful and they are custom fit for the situation and they are new, they are fresh, they are not stale. They're actually exactly what one needs in the midst of their suffering. Someone say amen right there. Here's the other thing. Did you notice this about the verse? He said not only are they fresh mercies that aren't stale and aren't worn out, he said that they're reliable mercies. He said they're not just new on some mornings. What's that word right there say? He says they are new Every morning. God's mercies are not just good for Sunday when you're here in church. God's not on like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule where he gives out mercies on certain days. He says they are new every morning. Everyone say every morning. Which means they are reliable mercies. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever had that friend who was unreliable? That friend, right, who says, hey, let me know if you need some help in the yard with that situation you got going on with your sprinklers. Just let me know if you need some help. Hey, let me know if you need any help moving or packing up that trailer. Let me know if you need some help. And you're like, oh, that was, that was really kind of you, man. Man, you're a good friend. And like two weeks pass, you call him up. Hey, can you help me come load this trailer? Ah, well, I got stuff going on. You all have that friend, don't you? You might have that relative that's that way. And they say, oh, I, you know, I wish I could, but I can't. It was a great offer to help in your, in your time of need, but they were unreliable. God's mercies are not that way. They are new and they are faithful every morning. They are custom fit for the situation, exactly what one needs in the midst of their suffering, which is why the prophet ends with, great is your faithfulness, God. It echoes also what the psalmist says in Psalm 86, verse 15, about God's mercy. Look what he says. But you, O Lord, are a God, what's the next word? Merciful and gracious slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth. See, this is God's very character. It is his very nature. It is not that sometimes he's merciful and gracious and other times he's not. This is who he is to his core, and he does not change. And his merciful character, it actually makes him a, quite a compassionate comforter. Now, as we're talking about mercies and grace in the midst of suffering, maybe, maybe like myself, you've thought at times, well, man, Brian, that all sounds good, but right now I'm suffering and I feel like God is really distant. I feel like God is very distant and my suffering is right up close in my face right now. 
I feel as if God is sleeping and a little unconcerned or disconcerned while my problem and my suffering is wide awake. If you've ever had that feeling of, well, you know, that's great. God's a a merciful, gracious, compassionate comforter by nature, but right now I'm not feeling very comforted. I'm just suffering. You know what? You're not alone. And you're not alone simply because I would fall in that same camp with you sometimes. But actually, this is a sentiment we see all throughout the Scriptures. Like all throughout the Bible, I love how honest the Bible is about the real feelings of human beings. Because that's really what the scriptures are, right? It's a collection, it's a story about Jesus Christ and his redemptive work to go to the cross. But it's also a story about fallen human beings and the help they receive from God to get through what it is they're going through to bring glory to him. All throughout the scriptures, I could give you 10 of these, but I'm going to give you two for sake of time. We see people crying out in this way, uh, j- just, just like what you feel like right now in your spirit. Job, chapter 13, Job cries out. You remember the story of Job? He has every, he's a righteous man. He's doing right. He has everything taken away. God took away everything. I mean, except his nagging wife. That was maybe part of the whole you know, tra- trial there. I don't know. We don't know. I didn't know his wife. I can't speak to that, right? But he had his, his, his wealth taken away, had his livestock taken away, had his health taken away. This guy had a bad couple of days, lost his children, and he's in desperation. And look, see if this, what he cries out, doesn't fit what you feel at times in your suffering. He says, oh Lord, why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? What, God, why can't I see you? Why are you so far from me that your face is hidden from me in this moment of greatest need? And he cries out to God. Now, we know God answers him, but it's a real feeling. The, the psalmist in Psalm 10 asks something similarly. He cries out despairingly. He says, oh, Lord, why do you stand afar off? Why are you so far away? My problems are right here, and it feels like you're a million miles away, Lord. Why do you hide yourself? In times of trouble. See, those are real, honest feelings that we all experience when we're suffering, right? There are times when we feel alone. There are times when we feel as if God is is just not present, even though all of our suffering and our trials are. And those are honest, real feelings, and that's exactly why we need the next part, to deal with those feelings. If you're you're taking notes, write down number two is this. Not only do we see the, the person of comfort, but number two, we see the promise of comfort. We need a promise today. In the midst of that suffering. Promise of comfort. Look, at, look back to the verse. Verse 3 and 4 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comforts. So that's who he is in his character. Look at verse 4. Who comforts, what's the next word? Who comforts us in all our affliction. Affliction there, it, it literally, what it literally means is, is stress or pressure. Anybody in the room have any stress and pressure in their life today? Anybody at all? Yeah, me neither. Okay, that was like three hands, all right? Now, we all face it, man. It feels like life is just one big stress and pressure. We move from one thing to the next thing, right? We might have a, a week or two or a day or two of peace, and then it's right back into more problems in this fallen world. Now, we, we all face afflictions, like what Paul says. We all face suffering and difficult seasons of circumstances that we would not choose in this fallen world. But we must remind our hearts of the truth that Paul gives us here today. He says that God will comfort us in those seasons of suffering. God will always be present to comfort us in that season of suffering. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And so what that means is that God is not just a merciful, gracious, compassionate comforter in a general sense. That means he is your merciful, comforting, faithful, compassionate, gracious comforter today. He's yours. He's your heavenly father who has your best interest in his glory and in mind. And so we can lean on him for that comfort. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And he knows, listen to me, someone needs to hear this today. He knows exactly what you're going through today. Sometimes you may feel as if he is distant. But as your heavenly father, he knows exactly what you're going through. Listen to me. He sees you and he hears you and he knows. Uh, My wife and I, we like to watch that show, uh, The Bachelorette, sometimes. You ever watch that show? None of y'all are going to admit it this morning, I know, right? Too pious. We haven't watched it much lately. We used to watch it a lot. But on that show, whenever the girl on there, one of the, one of the phrases that they say, or a couple of the phrases they say pretty often, um, is that 
the, the girl speaking of the guy that she likes in whatever show it is, this is what she says about him when she's trying to describe how she likes him. She says, I just feel, I just feel like he sees me, right? Right? Sorry for the lisp in there. I'm not trying to mock her. It just <laughs> came out that way. I just, I just feel like he sees me. I just feel like he understands me, right? And what's she saying in that? She's saying, he gets me. He appreciates me. He appreciates what I bring to the table. He appreciates what I'm going through, my perspectives. He sees me for who I am. And, he, and he, he listens and he understands where I'm coming from. That's what they're trying to get across when they say that phrase. Listen to me today. Can I tell you this about your God, the God of all comfort? He sees you and he hears you and he understands what you're going through in your suffering. You know, the scriptures call Jesus, you know what they call him, one of his titles? Man of suffering. He faced a few, didn't he? He faced being rejected and betrayed by friends, the loss of family, the loss of his very life on the cross, the the suffering that he received at the hands of the Pharisees constantly as they chided him and ran their mouths about him, right? Condemned him. The suffering that he faced on the way to the cross, the beatings, the scourgings, the mockings. Jesus knows a thing or two about suffering, doesn't he? He's the man of suffering, and he understands and he sees and here's what you're going through right now, wherever you sit. I don't, know, I don't know what it is that you brought in today. It could be anything from cancer to kids to your marriage to your finances to your job. He knows the season of suffering that you're in. He sees you and he hears you and he knows. I mean, in Exodus chapter 2, don't turn there. You can jot it down for later. In Exodus chapter 2, I was reading through this uh, earlier this year. I try to read it two to three chapters um, in, in the scriptures each day because it allows me to work my way through all the scriptures each year versus just kind of getting hung up on a couple ones that I love. And that way you guys get messages that are across the, the, the course of scriptures, which is good. But I was reading, I started at the beginning, I started in Genesis and go through. And I was in Exodus and I was reading chapter 2 and this really spoke to me. It's the part of the story where God's people are in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. And you've probably heard the story or you've seen the movies. They're, they're, they're being cruelly handled. Uh, uh, Pharaoh has, has increased their workload, taken away aspects of, of tools that they had, and it's making them work harder. And, and they're groaning, and they cry out, and they pray to God for deliverance. And, and you, we can only imagine, in, in the smallest sense, what they were enduring. Feeling like they've been rejected by God, feeling like they're in, they're in bondage because they were, and suffering underneath this cruel taskmaster, Pharaoh. And they cry out to God for help. And this is what, this is what Exodus 2 says. Let me just read it to you. It says, uh, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, have heard their cry, and I know I understand their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. He has seen, he has heard, he has understood, he knows them, and he's come down to deliver them. Can I tell you something today? Listen. Even though many years have passed since Exodus 2 took place, our God hasn't changed a bit. He is still the same God he was in Exodus 2 as he is today in 2023. He sees you and he hears and he understands and knows the suffering that you're going through and he wants to comfort you in the midst of that. Can I tell you something today? I feel like we need to wake up a little bit this morning, all right? God's eyes, his eyesight has not grown dim. His ears have not grown dull, and his mind has not grown feeble over the years. He is the same God that he was then as he is now, and he sees you, and he hears, and he knows what you're suffering with, and he wants to comfort you. Someone say amen right there. That's the God we serve. He hasn't changed. He's not just some comforter. He is your compassionate, gracious comforter, and he understands. Now, in Exodus, here's the deal. Here's the rub. In Exodus, the passage I just read from, God's comfort for his children, for his people, it came in the form of deliverance, which is wonderful, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful when you pray about something and God just, man, boom, miracle, woo, now we're ready to go. I got better, man, I got money in the bank account, woo, thank you, Lord. We love those moments. And those moments happen sometimes. I've had them happen in my own life. I'm sure you have too. But but, but the reality is most of the time, I would say, much of the time when it comes to suffering, God's form of comfort is not his deliverance, is it? He often doesn't take the suffering away right when we ask, the moment that we ask, which is why the promise Paul gives us here from the Lord is so powerful. What Paul is saying here in this verse is that God doesn't always deliver us from the trouble, but he always is willing to comfort us in the trouble. 
He may not pick us up and take us out of the trouble and the suffering, but he will pick us up and he will carry us in the midst of the suffering. Are you all with me? That's the God that we serve. And he wants to comfort us as we cry out to him. And his presence will comfort us, comfort us no matter the circumstances in our life when we come to him. And one of the ways it's really practical here before we move on. One of the ways it's really practical that we can actually receive the comforting of God is not just crying out in prayer like the Israelites did in Egypt. One of the ways is actually mentioned in the very first word of the verse behind me. What's the very first word there? Can you guys read it for me? You ready? Go. Blessed. I can tell some of y'all grew up in church because you said blessed, right? It's, it's blessed when you grew up in church. It's blessed any other time. Either way you want to pronounce it, it's the same word, all right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the word blessed there is actually where we get our English word eulogy, okay? You know what a eulogy is? It, mean, it's a, it means to, to speak well of, to declare truths about, or to praise. And Paul here is doing this about God, his heavenly father. He is praising, he is declaring truths about his heavenly father. It sounds a lot like singing, doesn't it? If only, I mean, think about it, if only there were a place every Sunday where we could gather together and we could sing and declare truths about who God is in praise and in worship, if only there were a place like that, right? I mean, if only there were a place like every Sunday at 9 and 10, 30 a.m., where we could show up on time, praise the Lord, right? And we could sing songs and declare truths about who God is. You, you guys are starting to get what I'm saying, aren't you? All right? See, see, what we're doing here this morning, what you're gathered to do, is actually one of the ways in which we find comfort amidst our suffering. One of the ways that you can weather the storm and weather the suffering that you are experiencing right now and experience the comfort of God is actually by praising God and singing. Now, I know some of us don't feel that way because I see you during the worship time. You got your arms crossed and you're like, Meh. right? I see you. Everybody else does too, okay? Like singing is not just something we fill the time with before they let me loose. They cut me loose and let me out of the cave to preach for 45 minutes. That's not what it is. It's there to prepare our hearts for the reception of God's word. But it's also there for us to fix our eyes on who God is because it's such a powerful form of comfort in the midst of suffering and in the midst of the fallen world that you've been enduring all week. See, praise, you've heard the expression, prayer changes things, and that's true. But I'm going to tell you this morning, praise changes things. Praise actually ignites faith in us in a way that many other things cannot. Gathering, singing truths about who God is each Sunday is a powerful reminder to our weary hearts of who God is, of how big our God is, and our vision becomes clearer of who God truly is. Uh, the theologian A.W. Tozer, he's been with the Lord for many years now, and a brilliant man. Uh, A.W. Tozer said it like this, he says, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What you think about when you think about God and who he is is the most important thing about you. He says, a very high view of God, because you've been praising and singing out, right, declaring those truths, a high view of God will lead to a small view of your problems and your suffering. It will shrink that suffering down to size. But when you re refuse to praise, when you refuse to look at God and who he is and fix your eyes on his greatness and bigness, you know what will happen instead is that suffering and that problem will increase in your purview. You all with me? See, a, a, a high view of God leads to that low view of your suffering. And so in focusing on who God is and singing praises to him, what we do is we flip the script on our suffering. doesn't mean the suffering is going to go away just because you sing a song or two. But, but, but it changes our perspective. It changes our heart. I mean, goodness, if y'all see your pastor riding down 83 on the way to work some days, you might see me with my hands off the wheel because I like to listen to worship music in the car. You know what I mean? One of those Jesus takes the wheel moments. Just take it, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship and pray I get past this semi coming at me, right? But I do. I love, to, I love to worship. And you can do that on your own time for sure. But there is something about gathering together with God's people and singing and declaring those truths in song and praising God for who he is that changes our perspectives and it lifts our spirit and it shrinks the size of that suffering if even only for a moment, does it not? It's like the old hymn says that, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. Do you know this one? 
And the things of earth, even our suffering, will grow strangely what? Dim. In the light of his glory and his grace. That's what blessing the Lord does. what praising the Lord does. It shrinks the size of those problems and that suffering. And it gives us comfort in those seasons of suffering. So for many of you in the room, maybe who haven't made this gathering on Sunday a priority for you. Maybe the the encouragement for you today is to be faithful each week in praise. Be faithful here every week. Gather together so that we might sing about those truths of who God is. You might be surprised at the comfort you'll find when in the pew each Sunday rests your behind, all right? Some of y'all get that in a minute. I wish I could say that was like an old Puritan proverb or something, but I actually made it up. I did. Praise, it ignites faith. Are you engaging in that? Now, now for some of you here, you probably would say, you know, Brian, this is all good and it sounds good, but, but I've actually been praying and crying out like the Israelites did to God. And I've actually been praising God. I'm I'm here on Sundays, but it just feels like my suffering, it feels like my pain will not pass. Anybody feel that way today? It's very, very possible, and I would say likely in a group this size, that maybe it has not passed. Can I I tell you this with all the, the compassion and loving kindness I can muster? Be patient in your suffering. It's hard to do. I'll be honest with you. It's hard to to suffer, especially when it's extended periods of time, isn't it? But but, but I think the encouragement that Paul would give us here is that that we can be patient in our suffering because God's in control of the timing of our suffering. Did you notice what he calls him, by the way? This is very, this seems minor, but it has big implications. Paul didn't just say that God is a comforting person, okay? Well, he's just a comforting individual because people are limited by their own time, their resources, Me as a human being, I'm limited by my circumstances, and so are you. He didn't call him just a person of comfort or someone who is sometimes comfortable. What was the title he gave him? He calls him the God. Everyone say God. He is the God of all comfort. And the fact that he is God means that he is sovereign and in control of everything. He is limited by nothing. He is shaped by nothing. He is controlled by nothing except his perfect holy will. And so in your suffering, you can be patient and trust God's timing, even though it's not comfortable. If you guys are with me, say yes. God is never early in our suffering, and God is never late. Sometimes you guys are never early in here, are you? Right? That's true. God's never early. God's never late. He's always right on time. And you can trust his timing in the midst of your suffering. Now, we're really bad at waiting, aren't we? Any bad waiters in here? I'm terrible at waiting. I'm very, very impatient at times, right? We live in the age of like instant Keurig coffee and microwave popcorn and like Amazon Prime that's supposed to get here in two days. And when it's like three days, we're like fuming, right? Part of that's because of where we live. It takes them forever to get it out here, right? It's like uh, waiting in the, the doctor's office. You guys like waiting in the doctor's office? Boy, isn't that, boy, that's just a trial, trial from the devil, isn't it? Got a little bone to pick with our doctors and nurses. We love you and we appreciate you. You've saved many of our lives. But that doctor's waiting room experience is terrible. You know, you know how it goes? See, I, I, what I thought would happen when I began going to the doctor many years ago is I thought they would give you an appointment time. And then you show up at that appointment time. And then you see a doctor at that appointment time who says, here's what this strange rash on your arm is. Let me give you some medicine. See you later. That's what I thought. That's not what happens at all. Has this been your experience? You show up on time when they told you to be there, and you sit and you wait for 30 to 45 minutes in the waiting room, trying your best not to touch all those dirty, germy surfaces all around you that those other sick people have been touching. Am I preaching this morning to anybody? I am terribly impatient, Right? And you try to thumb through the few magazines or you look through your phone and finally a nurse pops her head out and says, "Uh, we'll see Brian Wilson next. And I get all excited. Hallelujah. I'm going to see the doctor. But no, no, it doesn't happen. It's a dirty trick to demoralize you and they go back and put you on a scale, right? Like a piece of livestock. And they're like, yep, you're still overweight. That's good. Way to go. And then you say, okay, finally, I've I've been through enough. Now now I'm going to see the doctor. No, still not. Then they put you in a holding cell, called an exam room, for another 20 minutes or so while you wait on the doctor to come, right? I think, I think this is really resonating with people this morning, isn't it? Man, waiting's terrible, isn't it? Waiting's terrible at the doctor's office, but here's what I know is even worse. 
Waiting is really difficult when we're suffering, isn't it? Man, when things are going wrong with your health or things are going wrong with your family or with your kids or with your finances or at work or whatever that situation is in your life, it's difficult for us to wait patiently underneath the suffering that God's allowed to come into our lives to shape us. But Paul would tell us here, we can be patient in the midst of that suffering. We can trust God's timing because he is God, he is sovereign, he's in full control, and his timing is always perfect, and his comfort is always consistent in the midst of that suffering. Someone say amen right there. It's hard, and I know it, but be patient in your suffering. Then number three, here's the last point today. Let me give you this. We see the person of comfort, the promise of comfort, but number three, and this is really important, the purpose of comfort. The purpose of comfort. Look back at our passage, verses three and four, 2 Corinthians 1. Just read it all again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. That's who he is. Verse four, who comforts us in all our affliction. That's what he does. That's his promise. And then here's the purpose so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's an interesting perspective on suffering, isn't it? So often in the midst of our suffering, we are focused only on ourselves and our discomfort and our desire to get out from underneath that suffering season. But God says he's actually working a purpose in that suffering. Later on in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul's going to write, I think it's in chapter 12, um, about his thorn in the flesh that he has. We don't know exactly what it was. It was some kind of physical situation that he dealt with. But he cries out to the Lord. He says, God, please take it away. He says, I tr- asked God to take this away three times. I've been praying. And we all know Paul was a praying man. We all know God was a praising man because he was the guy in jail with, with Silas and they prayed and like shook the walls down. Remember that whole thing? He was doing all the right things. But in the midst of his suffering, when he cried out to God, he says, this is what God told me. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in the middle of your weakness. That's what he told him. And so that's really powerful, and that's important. We should remember that as part of the promise. God's grace and his comfort is sufficient for you. But here in this part of the passage, you know what Paul's saying? He says, God is saying to us, Not only is my grace sufficient for you in your suffering, but my grace is sufficient enough to flow through you in your suffering as well. You see, the comfort here, don't miss this, it's so important. The comfort that we receive from God, the comfort that God gives his children freely and graciously, it isn't an end in and of itself. It's a means to an end. We are comforted so that we can extend that same comfort and grace to those around us who are suffering. See, your suffering is not just about you. It's about that person coming after you who's going to face the same trial and the same suffering, and you're going to be able to give that grace away. And what's what's the line we've been saying all series? The grace we've been given is what? It's meant to be given away. The grace that we've been given, the comfort we've been given, is meant to be given away away. So if you've ever wondered, like I have, in the midst of your suffering, why? Why, God? What's the purpose? Why am I having to endure this cancer? Why am I having to endure this thing with my teenager? Why am I having to endure this situation at work? Why am I having to endure this situation in this friendship, this relationship? Why am I suffering in this season? There's your answer, at least in part. You're suffering and you're being comforted so that you can comfort others around you who are suffering. See, there's a responsibility to give away the gracious comfort that we have been given, but it's not just a responsibility. It's actually probably the most powerful form of comfort that human beings can give. Isn't that true? When you, when you stop and you look into the eyes of someone who has survived cancer and you're facing a cancer diagnosis, There's probably nothing in this life more powerful than that person looking at you and saying, listen, God will get you through this. There is hope found in Jesus. Keep your eyes on him because I didn't think I was going to make it in the midst of my suffering, but his presence was enough amidst the suffering in this pain of cancer and chemo and all the different aspects and levels that go along with that. God will be enough for you just like he was enough for me no matter the outcome. There's something powerful about hearing that, isn't there? See, there's something powerful about sitting across the, the table and having a cup of coffee with someone who says, man, my marriage almost ended. My marriage was a mess. 
and, and your marriage is a mess right now. But that person looks across the table and says, by God's grace and by his comfort, he helped me to endure that difficult season. And we came out on the other side. And the same God that I had my eyes fixed on that gave me comfort will give you comfort in this season too. You can have hope in that. There's something powerful about that. There's something powerful about looking across the table at someone who's lost a loved one or lost a child unexpectedly. And then looking at you who's experiencing the very same thing. And they say, listen, I thought I was in the depths of despair. I did not think there was going to be a way out. I did not think life was going to go on. But God's grace and his comfort was sufficient for me. And right now I'm going to let his grace flow through me to you and point you to that same very grace. His grace is sufficient for you too in this season. So there's something powerful about having experienced that kind of suffering. And so God's comfort in your life hasn't reached its end just because you've moved on from the situation. What Paul is saying is that God's comfort in his grace should now be passed along to others who have suffered or who are suffering too. And, and, and here's what's painfully beautiful about this whole thing. And I, and I use those words carefully. What's so painfully beautiful is this. The more we suffer, the better equipped we are to serve others. John MacArthur is a theologian and a pastor. He said it like this. He said, those who experience the most suffering will receive the most comfort. And those who receive the most comfort are most richly equipped to comfort others. I don't know about you. I wish there was another way, don't you? I wish God could prepare me to serve other people and prepare me to comfort others and and help those in his kingdom and his family. I wish I could take a class and be prepared. I wish I could read a book and be prepared. But the reality is our suffering is preparing us to serve, preparing us to comfort in a way that we couldn't otherwise. Listen to me. Suffering widens our banks to allow more of God's grace and comfort to flow through us to other people. You might remember last week we talked about that there's a big difference between reservoirs and rivers, aren't there? A reservoir is a place where you collect water. Water comes in, it doesn't necessarily go out unless you want it to, but it's trapped in there. A reservoir is meant to collect to keep water to itself. What is the purpose of a river? A river in its banks allows water to flow through it to others and other locations downstream. It doesn't keep it to itself. It doesn't dam it up. It allows it to flow through it. And so what Paul is saying here, this is so important. He says, our suffering right now, that painful thing you are experiencing, what it's doing is it's widening your banks and it's deepening the channel so that more and more of God's grace and God's comfort can flow through you to others who are suffering. And so the the painful truth in this is, is that your suffering is actually preparing you right now for greater service for the Lord. Your suffering, whatever that is you carried in today, I don't know what it is, God knows it. He's using it to shape you. He's using it to change you and to prepare you for greater service. And when you suffer, God is equipping you. And the extent to which we suffer is the capacity to which we can help others who are suffering. The suffering does, it just does something very interesting to us. It, 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 there's a humbling effect in suffering, isn't there? When things are going well for us and life is great and the sun is shining and there's all those butterflies and rainbows and unicorns like we talked about earlier, sometimes we can, we can prop ourselves up in judgment and we can lack compassion for other people, can't we? If the thought crosses our mind, well, they should just get their stuff together like I've gotten my stuff together. But there's something when we are, when we are suffering and we're going through a season of pain, there's something in that that humbles us. And you know what it does? It creates more of a compassion for other people. So that we have a, not only are we equipped to comfort them, but we actually have a desire to comfort them. That suffering, it, it, it softens our hearts and it sharpens our edges so that we are, are better equipped to comfort and serve those around us who are suffering. You see, Paul wants us to know you're suffering today, whatever that might be. Through your suffering and through his comfort in that suffering, God is growing you, maturing you, 
shaping you and equipping you to give his grace away to someone else today. And that might not be the only purpose in your pain, but that for certain is at least one purpose in your pain today. And so what I would like you to do today is this. This is our application. I want to challenge you to give grace away today. The grace and the comfort that you've experienced through whatever that season of suffering is that God's brought you through, or maybe it's one you're in right now, would you be willing to give that grace away to someone else around, around you? Now, that's going to take us opening our eyes and getting our eyes off ourselves because a lot of times the Lord can't use us to comfort others because we're so consumed with our own things, right? And maybe that's your prayer today. God, open my eyes to the suffering of those people that are around me that need help. They need the comfort that you've given me and help me to be there to be able to comfort those people in the midst of their suffering. But I want to challenge you, give that grace away. Remember, the grace that we've been given is meant to be given away. It's not an end in and of itself. It's it's a means to an end that we're to pass on to those around us who are experiencing suffering. Now, I suspect, go ahead and close your Bible. I suspect some of you in the room probably would say, well, Brian, this all sounds good and God has comforted me. He's brought me through a really difficult season. But, But I'm just not... I'm not prepared to comfort someone else. I don't know what to say. I'm not a pastor. I don't, I don't know what to tell them. I don't necessarily know what verses to point them to. I, I, don't, I don't know how to, to tell them and explain all the whys of their situation, why they're going through this, and what God's trying to teach them in the midst of this. Listen very close to this. Don't miss this as we close. The reason you're equipped to comfort others in their suffering is not because you know all the whys. It's impossible for us as human beings to know all of the wise in the midst of someone's suffering. We're not God. Only God knows those things. And many things we probably won't know this side of heaven. The, the grace and comfort you and I give to others who are suffering, it does not come from knowing the why. It comes from knowing the who. You see, the same God who carried you through that season of suffering in your life Our job in comforting others is to point them to that same God as well. That we say, you know what, I was in a hard season. I was suffering with something in my health or something in my family or something in my finances or whatever the situation may be. I was suffering in that season and I fixed my eyes on who God was and he comforted me and he helped me. And our job in comforting others is to point them to that same who that you look to in the midst of your suffering as well. See, you're more prepared and more equipped today than you ever imagined. You've been through things. God's carried you through things. His grace has been sufficient for you in seasons, and he has prepared you to help others, to give his grace away, to give his comfort away by pointing them to himself. Amen? Listen, the way of grace is to comfort as we've been comforted. Will you choose to walk the way of grace and give grace away today? Let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the comfort that you give us in difficult seasons. Thank you, God, that you don't let us settle because you're never settled for where we are. You always want to press us forward and shape us more in the image of your son. And God, we know you do that through suffering. And though it's painful, we thank you for it, Lord. Because it fixes our eyes on you in praise and in prayer. Teaches us to be patient as we wait under that hand of suffering. And God, we know that the purpose in it, at least in part, is so that we might give comfort to others as we've been given. Father, help us as a congregation to be willing to give grace away today, to not let it stay with us alone, to not be a a cul-de-sac, but to be a freeway. That we would not be reservoirs, but we'd be rivers with wide banks and deep channels so that more of your grace and comfort can flow through to those around us who are suffering. And Father, we'll give you the glory and the praise for what you do through our lives as you do this work of grace in us. And as you do this work of grace through us. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet?